Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary, sea-influenced school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G. I. Gurdjieff and P. D. Ospensky. Mr. Ospensky said, The most important ideas and principles of this system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable, because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. What he meant was that this system comes from higher mind, from conscious influence. It is an objective system to bring a man to awakening. Welcome to Wisdom Through Action. I'm your host, Kay Smith. Thousands of years ago, people came to the idea that man can change, that he can acquire something he did not already possess. What he can acquire was expressed differently and approached from different angles, but the general idea was always the same, that man can develop, that he can acquire something new. As you may recall from previous shows, when a person is interested in B influences, that is influences that originated from conscious influence, with study and right conditions, a magnetic center may develop in you. With the help of this magnetic center, you can begin to see, understand, and distinguish between A influences and B influences, or ideas and teachings of a higher nature. This may bring you to a school. Now, Now, schools are not all the same. For some kind of people, one kind of school is necessary, and for another kind of person, a different kind of school is necessary. There are no universal schools that would match all kinds of people. Today, we are going to talk about ancient schools of yoga. Not the yoga we know now in contemporary countries, but the original and esoteric schools of yoga of the East and of antiquity. The word yoga can be translated by the word unity or union. Also, it corresponds to the word harnessing or subjugation from the Sanskrit word yug or yoke. One of the meanings of the word yoga is right action. To follow ancient esoteric yoga meant to subjugate thoughts, feelings, and internal and external movements, and all other functions that ordinarily worked without control to the discipline of yoga. In India and the East, there were esoteric schools of yoga. The men who passed through a certain school and lived according to the principles of the school were called yogis. There are many stories about yogis. Sometimes they were said to be mystics and led a life of contemplation, indifferent to comforts most men desired, and at other times they were said to have miraculous powers, such as seeing or hearing at a distance, or were able to control animals and many other forms of powers. Mainly these powers and capacities could be acquired by the exercises and techniques which constituted the secret teaching of esoteric yoga and enabled yogis to understand people and to act rightly in any given situation. Esoteric yogis were not fakirs. The techniques of yoga, or the science of yogis, that was, the methods used by yogis for the development in themselves of extraordinary powers and capacities, came from remote antiquity. Thousands of years ago, the sages of ancient India knew that the powers of man could be greatly increased by means of right training and by accustoming man to control his body, mind, attention, will, emotions, and desires. In connection with this, the study of man in ancient India was on a level quite inconceivable to us. This can only be explained by the fact that the philosophical schools existing at that time were directly connected with esoteric schools. Man was considered as an incomplete entity and as containing in himself a multitude of latent powers. These powers were dormant but could be awakened and developed by means of a certain mode of life, by certain exercises, by certain work upon oneself. This is what is called esoteric yoga. An acquaintance with the ideas of esoteric yoga enabled man first to know himself better, to understand his latent capacities and inclinations, to find out and determine the direction in which they ought to be developed, 
and second, to awaken his latent capacities and learn how to use them in all paths of life. Now, there may have been not just one esoteric yoga, but actually five esoteric yogas, each one suited for a different type of man. Each of these had a practical and theoretical aspect. It is necessary to point out <clears throat> that <clears throat> excuse me, that the relationship between its practical and theoretical parts is analogous to the relationship between practical and theoretical sides in art. There exists a theory of painting, but the study of the theory of painting does not enable one to paint pictures. There exists a theory of music, but the study of the theory of music will not enable one to play any musical instrument. In the practice of art, as in the practice of yoga, there is something which does not exist and cannot exist in the theory. Practice is not built up according to theory. Theory is derived from practice. The science of esoteric yoga in India was kept secret for a long time and was only accessible to individuals who had renounced the world. The pupil, pupils of yoga were called chelas, and their teachers were called gurus. Until the second half of the 19th century, little was known about the sciences of the yogis. Actually, the fourth way that we teach, as well as esoteric yoga, have the same origin and are both the keys to all the ancient wisdom of the East. The ancient books written by gurus were incomprehensible for Western man and may still be because they were written by men who possessed a fully developed intellect as well as powers and capacities infinitely surpassing ordinary men. Esoteric yoga was said to strengthen the capacity of understanding. In addition, it, it increased the creative capacity of man, which enabled him to perceive through direct penetration the mysteries of nature and introduced him to the secrets of eternity and the enigmas of existence. Esoteric yoga enabled a man to strengthen his ability to deal with all the physical conditions in which he may have been born and which may have been hostile to him, as well as to struggle and overcome his personal limitations. It also helped him to struggle against imagination and to enable him to increase consciousness. It helped him to struggle against the de deception of words and to realize that ultimately truth could not be put into words and that words could only hint at the truth. Esoteric yoga taught the way to find the hidden truth concealed in things, in the actions of men in the writings of all the great sages throughout time. Esoteric yoga falls into five divisions. Raja Yoga, or the Yoga of the Development of Consciousness, Jhana Yoga, which is the Yoga of Knowledge, Karma Yoga, which is the Yoga of Right Action, Hatha Yoga, which is the Yoga of Power over the Body, and Bhakti Yoga, which is the Yoga of Right Religious Action. Thus we have five paths leading to perfection, to the transition, to higher levels of knowledge and life. One may need to begin with contemplation. One man may need to begin with contemplation. Another with the study of his own eye. Another may need the objective study of nature. And, a, and another person may first of all understand, need to understand the rules of conduct. The fourth needs to acquire control over his physical body. Maybe a fifth person needs to learn to pray, to understand his religious feelings and how to govern them. So esoteric yoga taught a man to do rightly everything that man did. By studying esoteric yoga, he began to see how wrongly he had acted on all occasions in his life, or how he had wasted his strength and attained little or nothing for it. It taught man the right economy of forces. And most of all, esoteric yoga taught man to do whatever he did consciously when it was necessary. And thus it helped man to increase his powers and the results of whatever work he did. Before a man changed for the better, he would first realize that he had been greatly mistaken about himself, 
that he was far weaker and less significant than he considered himself to be. And at the same time, he could become stronger and more powerful than he ever imagined. He saw what he was and what he could become. He lost the feeling of separateness and senselessness and acquired an understanding of his own aim, and it brought him into contact with other people with the same aim and going in the same direction. Esoteric yoga taught a man to discriminate between the real and the false, and this capacity for proper discrimination helped him find hidden truths, such as in the books belonging to the holy scriptures of India. Esoteric yoga taught how to search for and find truth in everything, and it taught that anything that could serve as a starting that anything could serve as a starting point for truth. The first thing to be realized by anyone who wished to study esoteric yoga was that it had many degrees of varying difficulty and could not be learned all at once. For the man who studied this yoga, new horizons opened before him as he continued on his way. But he could not see very far ahead and could not know all that this study would give. A man who entered the path of esoteric yoga with the aim of reaching its summits had to give himself entirely over to yoga, all his time and energy and attention, all his thoughts, feelings, and motives. He had to endeavor to harmonize himself to achieve inner unity, to create a permanent eye. He had to compel himself to follow one aim. All of the esoteric yogas, with the exception of karma yoga, required that a man withdraw from ordinary life, even if only for a certain amount of time. It was impossible to study esoteric yoga without a teacher and without a teacher's constant and incessant watch over the pupil. All the esoteric yogas taught that a man was an incomplete and imperfect being, but that he could be taught the necessary techniques to bring himself to the development possible for him by means of suitable instruction and training. First, it referred to man's inner world, and second, it referred to his physical body. The opening up of higher consciousness was the aim of all of the esoteric yogas. Esoteric Hatha Yoga, again, not the Hatha Yoga of the West, was the yoga of power over the body and over the physical nature of man. According to the teaching of esoteric yoga, a practical study of Hatha Yoga gave man ideal health, lengthened his life, and gave him many new powers and capacities which an ordinary man did not possess and which seemed almost miraculous. It indicated that a healthy body would be more easily subject to the will and consciousness and that would also be more able to endure the intense nervous system strains that developing higher consciousness may put on it. Therefore, the first aim of Hatha Yoga was a healthy body. There are many rules connected to the regulation and control of the different organs of the body. One of the fundamental ideas of esoteric yogis was that in its normal natural state, the body is not the ideal apparatus that we often think it is, and that many functions are only necessary to preserve the existence of the body in unfavorable conditions such as physical attack. Also that the body has many wrong functions that need to be corrected, balanced, harmonized, and purified. They affirm that there are also many functions that are only in a rudimentary state, which can be more fully developed. The esoteric yogis possessed numerous means for decreasing the useless functions of the body and bringing to light the new powers and capacities which remain latent for ordinary man. These esoteric yogis believed all the organs of the body could work for a common aim, a higher aim. Hatha Yoga dealt with the vegetable and animal functions. They had known for some time that the separate organs of the body function independently without a common center governing them all, and that the organs had the capacity to do the work of another organ when necessary. This latter information was discovered in the West just in the recent turn of the century. Esoteric yogis, in observing the separate lives of the organs, 
had come to the conclusion that the life of the body consisted of thousands of separate lives. Each such life presupposes separate souls in the organs and also in the tissues and all other substances of the body. So this was actually the esoteric side of Hatha Yoga. These separate lives were the spirits of the body and Hatha Yoga was the means to subordinate them to serve one aim. Hatha Yogis learned to control breathing, circulation of the blood, and nervous energy. They could, by holding their breath, stop almost entirely the functions of the body and sink into a lethargy in which a man could remain for a prolonged period of time without food, air, and without harm to himself. On the other hand, they could intensify the breathing and make it rhythmic with the beating of the heart and take in an enormous supply of vital force and use this force for, say, treatment of diseases, both their own and other people's. Through will and effort, the esoteric Hatha yogis were supposed to be able to suspend circulation of the blood in any part of the body or the opposite, bring an increased supply of fresh arterial blood and nervous energy. By learning how to govern their own bodies, esoteric Hatha yogis at the same time learn to govern the whole of the material universe. The human body represents a universe in miniature. It contains everything from mineral to God. This was a practical truth for an esoteric Hatha yogi. Through his body, man was seen to be in contact with the whole of the material universe and everything in it. The water contained in the human body connected man with all the water of the earth and the atmosphere. The oxygen contained in the human body connected man with all the oxygen in the whole universe. The carbon with the carbon, the vital principle with the vital principle. This was true because the water entering into the composition of man's body was not separated from the water outside the body. It was only as if it flowed through man. It was the same with the air and all other substances. While an esoteric Hatha yogi learned to control the various spirits in his own physical body, he also learned how to control the same principles in the world of nature. He learned to understand the laws of the universe and his place in the universe. This had to be done with the constant supervision of the teacher. There were too many pitfalls for a man to attempt this on his own. This was particularly true of esoteric Hatha Yoga because if you changed one thing, you had to balance it out with another thing and so on. And it was necessary to learn the principles of asanas. Asanas were special postures of the body that an esoteric Hatha Yogi had to learn to assume. Most of us are familiar with one of the easiest asanas, the simplest posture of Buddha was when a Hatha yogi sits cross-legged, not Turkish fashion, but with one foot placed on one knee with the sole of the heel facing upward and the other foot placed on its opposite knee, also with the heel facing upward. The legs are interwoven and it looks almost as though the bones are twisted. Apart from the external or outward asanas, there were also inward asanas, such as control of the heartbeat, and entire circulation of the blood. The ultimate aim of the outward asanas was attainment of control over the inner functions. So there existed over 70 asanas. In addition, the order in which they ought to be learned depended on the physical type of the man. For every man, there could be several asanas that were more easily learned than the others and with which he would be told to begin. There were also preparatory exercises with which he would begin. All this had to be determined by his teacher, who possessed complete understanding of Hatha Yoga. Study of a wrong asana contained great difficulties and could even harm a person. The work on esoteric Hatha Yoga was the overcoming and the transforming of physical pain. 
The overcoming of physical pain, overcoming the fear of physical pain, overcoming the continual and incessant desire for quiet, ease, and comfort created the force which transferred an esoteric Hatha Yogi to another level of being. Raja Yoga was the esoteric yoga of the education of consciousness. The man who studied Raja Yoga acquired consciousness of his I, as well as inner powers, control over himself, and the capacity to influence others. Raja Yoga was to his psychic world as Hatha Yoga was to his body. Raja Yoga was the overcoming of illusory self-consciousness and the acquiring of control over consciousness. It did this through the knowledge of himself. Raja Yoga was the placing of consciousness, which was similar to placing the voice in singing. It was well known in the East that the placing of consciousness, like the placing of the voice, multiplied its power tenfold, increased its efficiency, allowed it to reconstruct the interrelation of ideas to a much greater degree. In the West, there can be a foggy idea about consciousness being a blanket state, when in reality, at a certain level, it is possible to direct and focus one's consciousness like a beam and have more concentrated results. Raja Yoga stated that man did not know himself, and this was the cause of his difficulties. Man did not know about his psychic world. It was analogous to a man who did not know his body, the parts of his body, or the relative position of the parts. He would at best only have part of the puzzle of himself, and it would be askew. It taught that man did not know how to see the world he lived in as a whole, that everything was alive, and everything was connected, and he was connected to everything in a very practical way. Instead, he saw the world outside himself as disconnected from him, and he failed to see that the things that were not in his line of sight were still there and still existing through time. Raja Yoga taught about four states of consciousness possible for man. There was deep sleep, sleep with dreams, waking state, and Turiya, or state of enlightenment. Raja Yoga studied thinking, feeling, sensing, and so on, separately and in relation to each other. It studied dreams, semi-conscious and unconscious psychic processes, the study of illusions, self-deceptions, self-hypnosis, and self-suggestion, with the aim of becoming free from them. One of the first tasks a man who studied Raja Yoga had to attempt was the attainment of the ability to stop thoughts. The capacity not to think, to entirely stop the mind at will, to give a complete rest to the psychic apparatus, was regarded as a necessary condition for awakening. Only when a man had created in himself this capacity for stopping the flow of thoughts could he develop the ability to hear what other people were thinking, as well as all the voices which incessantly spoke in nature, the voices of various small lives which were part of himself, and the voices of big lives of which he was a component. Only in a passive state of stopping thoughts could he come in contact with the voice of silence, which alone could reveal to him truths and secrets hidden from him, things which were beyond any possible perception and had to be given. The practicality of stopping thoughts also benefited man because it reduced the needless expenditure of psychic energy consumed in needless thinking and random meanderings of the mind. This was even worse when a man was agitated or annoyed, hurt, afraid, suspicious, and so on. People did not realize what an enormous amount of energy is spent on this unnecessary turning over in the mind. The same thoughts, the same words, some silly sentence or fragment of a song which the mind is stuck upon. So when the disciple had learned not to think, he was taught to think. 
to concentrate on one thing and not let anything else come into his head. Along with this concentration, he could force himself not to feel, not to see, not to hear, not to suffer any physical pain or discomfort, thus not to be distracted in any way from what he was thinking about, the one thing he was concentrating on. The third technique was meditation. The student learned to enter deeply into a given question, to examine different sides one after another, to find in its correlations and analogies with everything he knew, everything he had thought or heard before. Right meditation showed a man an infinite an amount in things which he previously thought he knew all about. It showed him depths of thinking that never occurred to him before, and above all, it brought him nearer to the new consciousness, flashes of which, like lightning, began to illuminate his meditations, revealing to him for a moment infinitely remote horizons. The next step, the fourth, was contemplation. Man was taught, having placed before himself one or another question, to enter into it as deeply as possible without thinking, or even without putting any question before himself, to enter deeply into an idea, a mental picture, landscape, phenomena of nature, sound, or number. A man who had learned how to contemplate awakened the higher faculties and opened himself to conscious and cosmic influences and brought him to understanding the mysteries of the universe. Raja Yoga made man's eye the object of concentration, meditation, and contemplation, having taught man to economize his mental powers and direct them upon self-knowledge, knowledge of his real I. Esoteric Raja Yoga brought a man to feel the depths and heights of himself and to come in contact with eternity and infinity. And that is to show him that part of him is not mortal and does not die in a, a drop in the ocean of spirit, but a drop that may contain the whole ocean. The result being that a man attained a state of freedom and power. He could control himself. He could control the thoughts of others, had clairvoyance, knew the past and the future. While all this sounds fantastic, it was only acquired with complete control over oneself and knowledge and understanding of the working of the laws of the universe. The idea of non-attachment and separation of self occupied an important part of esoteric Raja Yoga. Man came in contact with his connection with everything in the universe. Esoteric Karma Yoga taught right living and was the yoga of activity. It could be practiced while in life and was a necessary supplement to all the other esoteric yogas because it taught the method for remembering aim and never losing sight of it. Without Karma Yoga, all the other esoteric yogas degenerated into the acquisition of unconscious powers which was not the real aim. Karma Yoga taught that the aim of inner development was self-development and wakefulness in any given situation. To stay awake in the midst of the hypnotizing influence of activity. It made a man remember that nothing external had any significance, that it was necessary to do the right thing without worrying about the external resultant. Karma Yoga taught a man to change his fate, to direct it at will. According to the principles of esoteric Karma Yoga, this was attained only by altering the inner attitude of man towards things and his own actions. If he altered his attitude, this would in time inevitably change the character of the events which he encountered on the way. Karma Yoga taught that when a man acted, it was not he himself that was acting, but a force acting through him. It taught him that these forces acting through him came from outside himself and that he could decide whether to go with the force or act independently of it. In this way, he saw that he was just a tiny screw in a tiny wheel in a big machine and that the success or non-success of what he was doing depended little on himself. Thus a man, being separate from the results of activities, could never meet with failure. The greatest unsuccess could actually further success in his inner work. In ordinary life, 
The chief aim is to avoid all unpleasantness, difficulties, and dif discomforts so far as is possible. In karma yoga, a man welcomed such unpleasantness, for it afforded him the chance to overcome it. When a man realized this, life itself became his teacher. The chief principle of esoteric karma yoga was non-attachment, and a man following this way had to practice this in every situation, good or evil, pleasure or pain. It was not indifference, it was a kind of separation of self from the events of his life. Every man from his birth was seen as surrounded by certain karma, by certain people and certain events, and in accordance with his nature, he adopted a certain definite attitude towards things, people, and events. So long as his attitude remained unchanged, everything around him remained unchanged because he attracted the same fate. When he changed his attitude, he attracted new and different events. Esoteric karma yoga was the only way possible for people who were tied to life, who had the life of someone famous or were a personage of power or a historical person or someone connected to the progress of the life of humanity. Karma Yoga gave freedom to the prisoner in custody as well as to the king on a throne, if only they could feel that they were actors playing their roles. Bhakti Yoga was the esoteric yoga of the religious way. Bhakti Yoga taught how to believe, how to pray, and how to attain certain salvation. Bhakti Yoga could be applied to any religion. Differences in religions did not exist for Bhakti Yoga. There was only the idea of the religious way. The yogi, Ramakrishna, who in the 18th, 1880s lived in a monastery near Calcutta and became world-renowned through the works of his disciples, Vivekananda and Abhidananda and others, was a Bhakti Yogi. He recognized as equal all religions with all their dogmas, sacraments, and rituals. He himself belonged simultaneously to all religions. Twelve years of his life were spent in following over and over again the way of asceticism according to the rules of each of the great religions in turn. And always he came to the same result, to the state of ecstasy. Ramakrishna used to say that he had arrived at the conclusion that all great religions were one and was convinced that all of them led to God, that was, the highest knowledge. In bringing man nearer to samadhi or ecstasy, bhakti yoga carried him away completely from the world. He acquired enormous powers, but at the same time lost the capacity for using them. In the book, The Gospel of Ramakrishna, a remarkable conversation is quoted between the sick Ramakrishna, who was already nearing death, and an Indian sage, a pundit, who came to visit him. Pundit Sashadar came one day to pay his respects to Bhagavan Ramakrishna. Seeing his illness, he asked, Bhagavan, why dost thou not concentrate thy mind upon the diseased part and thus cure thyself? And the Bhagavan replied, how can I fix my mind, which I have given to God, upon this cage of flesh and blood? Sashadar said, Why dost thou not pray to thy divine mother for cure of thy illness? The Bhagavan answered, When I think of my mother, the physical body vanishes, and I am entirely out of it. So it is impossible for me to pray for anything concerning the body. Thus, all that man attains on this way had no value from the earthly point of view and could not be used for the acquisition of earthly comforts. Ramakrishna taught that bhakti yoga was the best of all the ways of yoga because it did not require proof. It addressed itself directly to the feelings and brought together not people who thought alike, but those who felt alike. The practical significance of esoteric bhakti yoga lay in the emotional training. It was a method for those who were very emotional, but whose religious emotions were scattered and not concentrated. Monastic life was not bhakti yoga, 
but esoteric bhakti yoga included all religions and could be applied to all religions. When the aim was attained, the yoga became unnecessary. Jhana yoga was the esoteric yoga of knowledge. It led man toward perfection by changing his knowledge of himself and of the world in which he lived. This was the esoteric yoga of the intellectual way. It liberated the mind and led to the true knowledge showing the fundamental laws of the universe. Jhana yoga started from the affirmation that the weak human mind would never solve the enigmas of the world, that the mind must be educated and trained for contemplation and concentration and thinking in new categories, and not so much about the outward and physical world, but on the fundamental principles, to think quickly without waste on unimportant details. Jhana Yoga started from the fact that the chief cause of human misfortunes and disasters was Advidya, ignorance. And the object of Jhana Yoga was to overcome Avidya, or ignorance, and bring man nearer to what was called Brahma Vidya, divine knowledge. The aim of esoteric Jhana Yoga was the liberation of the human mind from those limited conditions of knowledge which came from forms of sense perception and by logical thinking based on opposites. A man must, first of all, learn right thinking. Right thinking and the broadening of ideas and conceptions must lead to the broadening of perception, while the broadening of perception must finally lead to a change in sensations and would help abolish false and illusory sensations. The disciple was given for meditation some verse from ancient scriptures or some symbol, and he meditated for a year, two years, possibly for ten years, from time to time bringing to his teacher the results of his meditations. This seems strange to our Western mind, which always aims at going ever forward, but possibly it was the right method for penetrating to the root of ideas instead of acquiring a superficial acquaintance with their external side by making enormous mental collections of words and facts. Esoteric jhana yoga was a method. A right method must necessarily lead to certain truths. And expounding a method, it is, not, it is impossible not to, to touch on these truths. The truth for a man can only be what he himself has verified, not what someone else has told him. Jhana Yoga taught that the truth for a man could only be that which he had felt is truth. Moreover, it taught man to verify one truth by another, to tend slowly towards the summit of knowledge, never losing sight of the point of departure and constantly returning to it in order to preserve a right orientation. Jhana Yoga taught that the truths realized by the logical mind were not truths from the point of view of higher consciousness. This esoteric yoga taught man to distrust himself, to distrust his sensations, mental images, concepts, ideas, thoughts, and words, above all to distrust words, to verify everything and always look around at every step, to demand that everything that had been found should accord with the testimony of experience and with fundamental principles. The ideas of jhana yoga had been transmitted in a symbolical form only. The images of Indian gods and the figures of Indian mythology contained many ideas of esoteric jhana yoga. The understanding of them required oral teaching. The study of jhana yoga from books was impossible because there existed a whole series of principles which had never been expounded in writing. For instance, the idea of dharma in one of its meanings in Indian philosophy was an introduction to the study of one of these principles, which may be called the principle of relativity. The principle of relativity in the science of esoteric yogis has nothing in common with the principle of relativity in modern physics and is studied not in its application to one class of phenomena only, but in relation to all the phenomena of the universe on all planes and levels. This was a brief outline 
of the five ancient yogas as they were taught in esoteric schools of antiquity. The word yoga in the contemporary world mainly refers to health and well-being, balance and a relatively harmonized inner state. As, as was pointed out early in the show, true esoteric schools of yoga are quite difficult to find. And for many of us, they're not sufficiently elastic and they may not suit our present mode of life. What is similar in each of the esoteric teachings that we've been discussing in our show here on Wisdom Through Action is the possibility of changing being. If you think about all that makes up your being, such as wrong work of centers, identification, considering, negative emotion, absence of unity, and so on, you will understand that all this can be changed if you find the right kind of esoteric school for you. As to which way is best suited for you? Well, that answer is actually in you. It is connected with what feeds your magnetic center and whether you have one or more of your centers or functions fully developed. In the system that we are teaching, often referred to as the fourth way, all the sides that can develop, develop at the same time, unlike the ancient yoga that I was describing, where one side is developed and then you go back and develop a different side. In the work, all four centers must be more or less alive, on the surface, open to receive impressions. Otherwise, long preliminary work to open them is necessary before one can begin. And with the work, with the work of the fourth way, there is no external giving up of things, for all work is inner. A man or a woman must begin the work in the same conditions in which they find themselves when they meet the work because these conditions are the best for them. If a person begins to work and study in these conditions, they can attain something. And later, if it is necessary, they will be able to change the conditions, but not before seeing the necessity of it. So at first, one continues to live the same life as before in the same circumstances as before. In many respects, this way proves more difficult than the other ways, for nothing is harder than to change yourself internally without changing the external world. This is a practical system, change of being, growth of understanding, and the increase of consciousness are some of the main objectives. Well, I want to thank you for watching our show today. Remember that you can easily watch each of our shows on our website at www.wisdomthroughaction.org. We offer online classes, so no matter where you live, if you feel that this way might be what your magnetic center has been searching for, email me. My email is real easy. It's kkay321 at verizon.net. And we'll see you next time here on Wisdom Through Action on SBN.